We just submitted our assignment twos, our uh, creature composites. Now, if we go to our course outline, I just want to show us where we are in our building of skills for the semester and what comes next. Because we're still going to be working with compositing skills of raster images. And we have until 11.59 tonight to get something turned in for what's due on this day. We're going to be discussing question of the day two at the beginning of next class. You also have until 11.59 tonight to meet the deadline for getting something in for that. That's the one that deals with the required reading of chapter two. Because when it comes to copyright law and the things we are responsible for as law-abiding citizens, there are some actual real facts we need to know that are not common knowledge. And this chapter helps us understand it. It's more than just suggestions. It gives us kind of definitions and understanding of things like the public domain and creative commons and how you can use it for your own work. And then the kind of work and the kind of exceptions where you are allowed. And it's not a long chapter. As you can see, I just scrolled through the whole thing. But that will give you some good basis of knowledge to be more informed when you tackle question of the day number two. So you want to do that by tonight as well. All right. Our next unit is not an assignment, it's what's called a proving ground. So if, if we look beyond today, we'll see that next class we actually are going to be, is the deadline for uploading our first proving ground. And so it's a quick turnaround. And we're not actually creating anything new here. We're just going to be revisiting assignment one and two and merging them together into what I call a creature scape. And we're going to learn more targeted practical applications of these compositing skills like dodging, burning, clone stamp, and things I've kept, I've promised and I've put into your assignment comments for your landscape, texture fills and atmosphere and these things that kind of tie everything together. Now we're in a better place to understand them and use them. Also next class, looking ahead, because we are to that point a quarter of the way through, you're going to start picking topics for your group presentations. So with your group, you're each going to agree on a topic, and that topic needs to be a contemporary digital art practice, right, in any field, commercial or fine art. So some examples might be things like character design, things like logo design, things like uh, motion graphics, typography, 3D modeling of tennis shoes, I don't know, fashion applications, fine art posters, fine art sculptures, fine art paintings, all, as long as they use digital as a major part of their process, right? It can be from any kind of, you're going to use samples and curate a show from any kind of influences that you want the class to know about. But you have to pick a, a theme with your group. So if a, a group picks logo design, then each member of the group would choose their own kind of digitally designed logos to include in that presentation. And you can look at assignment sheets. We'll look at it next class. It's not that you have to have your presentation ready. It's just you need to pick a topic for it. So I'll make sure you know about that next class. All right. And then once we're done with our proving ground, we're going to start it, let's see, here. And we want to upload it to Canvas after next class. So it's our only working day is going to be next class for it, but its actual deadline is on the 20th. And then we'll do our presentation critique and everything. So it gives us a little bit of time to refine everything. And then we get into our longest assignment of the semester, except for your final project, which is the animation project. And this is another thing to think about before our proving ground. Your animation project, it's going to be a simplified animation, a frame by frame GIF animation, but you have to use something that you've already designed in the class as part of your animation. So that can be exercise one, exercise two, assignment one, assignment two. But you have to use something. And to use it, we have to showcase what's called a transformation in the animation. 
So it's more than just a movement test. It's not enough to just make your creature walk. You're going to actually have to transform something or make your landscape look like a breeze is running through it. So for a transformation for your landscape, it might be something as simple as from day to night, right? Or for your creature, it might be that your creature like retreats into its shell and then pokes out. That would be transforming. Or that your creature changes color or that your creature spontaneously combusts. Like all of these would be transformations. And you can do goofy combinations too. You'll see some examples. But as we put our creatures into our environments, you'll see a lot of the, the potential for then animating your creature in that environment or animating the environment. So we're revisiting some past aspects. You can also include new aspects. So one that just springs to mind, a past student did a little 8-bit animation using some found composited sprites of like an old Pokemon game and Ash like capturing a Pokemon and used his creature as the Pokemon instead, that kind of thing and had the whole animation. So the transformation was the creature going into the Pokeball, coming out of the Pokeball, reversed it. So you can bring in new elements. It just needs to feature at least one thing you've already created. All right. So the proving ground. It's our next unit. Remember, you can always see the units in the course outline too. And it's unit six. So new skills are minimal here. It's more an application of the skills we've been learning over the last two assignments. And to earn your creative problem solving badge, the skill that they point out is important for creative problem solving is something they call identifying patterns. So we're doing this through creating a creature scape. It's looking back at the work you create and understanding its aspects, like the different thinking about it a little bit deeper, understanding its components and how it can be used. So this is going to give us a chance not just to get introduced to compositing raster files, but to actually start mastering some aspects of it, like making things match in, in their angle, in their lighting, in their atmosphere. We're going to be making sense of the data that we have created with these different raster files, whether it's our landscape and our creature and the limitations on that data. So one of these requirements is going to be that you identify what your resolution is and what the correct usage of that resolution would be. Is it for screen presentation or is it better suited to print presentation? We're going to understand how to glaze and add atmosphere using texture lays to improve overall engagement and believability. It's why most really expensive special effects scenes in live action movies are when it's dark and raining because that atmosphere helps a lot with the believability. We're going to become familiar with something we haven't done before, which are called non-destructive overlays to do things like dodging and burning in a way that doesn't actually affect the pixels. We've done a little bit of non-destructive clone stamping, but this is a way to, to add lighting and shading without hurting our, our core model. So it puts it into an, a more practical use. And we're going to keep, keep working on organizing our layers and our formats and our resolution and understanding our edges to create kind of the seamless composite right and then this is where the the creative problem solving comes in we have to recognize commonalities this is the the badges terminology recognize commonalities among seemingly unrelated situations so in this case by putting our creature that we've designed on its own into our landscape which we designed on its own there is no conceivable expectation that the lighting already matches between the two. So we have to recognize that and see where there are commonalities in the lighting and in the coloring and then try to between seemingly unrelated situations and then find ways to make them match, right? To pay attention to those things. Like what's the light source in your landscape? What's the dominant, the key light source? And then what kind of shadows would your creature cast? Is there any surface for them to cast shadows on? And we'll create those cast shadows, that kind of thing. And then the next is to frame novel problems in familiar terms. And this is going to be where you write, um, this is a new thing, a, no a novel situation, putting this fantasy creature into this fantasy landscape. So you have to communicate it in familiar terms. You have to help us understand. You can do this through writing, just a few sentences, a short paragraph, 
how does your creature interact with its environment? You know, how does it get energy? Uh, how does it protect itself? Is it prey? Is it preyed upon? However, is it in a symbiotic relationship with the plant life, with the, the organisms, whatever you might want to say? And we have some, some nice uh, examples of that. And it actually really does improve your concept work because it helps you reflect through new lens on your own creations. Okay, we're going to do this through looking at past examples. You have the YouTube examples. And then the only deliverable is what we call proving ground number one. It's the Creaturescape project. So, three components to it. One is one JPEG image <laughs> that shows your creature in your landscape in a way that you make as believable as possible. And sometimes to do that, you need to add a lot of atmosphere. So this is in the middle of like a very stormy, foggy night. When, but that's when this creature would kind of come out as a forager. The second thing you're going to say is whether it, its pixel dimensions, which will you'll give its physical dimensions and its pixels per inch, um, are better suited towards print resolution or screen resolution. And to get full credit for this proving ground, you have to state that, whether it's better for print or better for screen. And also state what its dimensions are and its resolution. That's its data. So this one is over 8 by 10 inches by at least 300 pixels per inch. So that's a good potential for print presentation. This one is 12 by 9 inches. That's over 8 by 10, but it's only 72 pixels per inch. That's standard minimum for screen resolution. Right? So you'll see some three other examples here. And it doesn't really matter how weird your creature is or what your landscape is. We can make them match. That's the challenge here. Even if you did an ice creature and you're going to put it onto the surface of the sun. We can make it work. Matching lighting, matching environment. You're just going to be adding a lot of steam in that, in that instance. Okay, so some things to think about when doing this project are instances where you have a mismatch between figurative elements and background elements. So I love these, these classic examples of things like Mary Poppins, where you just had, had hand-drawn animation into film. Or this is the first Space Jam movie, where you had the first use of 3D modeled animated figures so that they could cast shadows along with Michael Jordan. Right. And you have the new Space Jam, which just does that, the dizzying effects with lots of key lights and textures. This is a pretty involved rubric. It's not as simple as zero to three points. It's zero to 1.5 points, but this is why. Because in order to earn the badge under the Identify Patterns one, there'll be four proving grounds through the semester. You have to get 100% on all of these criteria, right? So I make them pretty easy to get and easy to correct so that you can get them by the end, but we will be following this. So making sense of the data, recognizing commonalities among seemingly unrelated situations, and frame novel problems in familiar terms. And all of this has been approved by an outside committee and said this does earn you this badge. It's like a, a separate course within the course. Now, you're only going to post those three things you saw on the last page. But we're going to be creating what's called a non-destructive overlay layer as part of this process. And what's so fascinating about that, and this is what you'll see in the making ofs on your, your movies and your streaming content all the time, it's showing kind of a layer mask, though we're not going to do it with clipping masks, of the cast shadows and like the steam and the different kind of key lighting, all in a way that doesn't affect your core model of your character. So that's all the stuff we're going to learn. What do we need to do that? We need access to your first two assignments in their best possible forms. So that means opening up your PSDs for both assignment one, and I'm just going to do them just for expediency, just for this video in Photoshop, and assignment two. But of course, you can do this in um, PhotoP as well. And then we're just going to make some quick decisions. 
So first of all, before we start,